and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today we are privileged to welcome as our speaker and discussant, Dr. Miles Yu. He is a senior fellow and director of the China Center at the Hudson Institute here in Washington, DC. He is also a professor of East Asia and military and naval history at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Dr. Yu specializes in Chinese military and strategic culture, U.S. and Chinese military and diplomatic history, and U.S. policy toward China. Dr. Yu joined the Trump administration and served as the China policy advisor to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. In that capacity, he advised the secretary on all China-related issues, helped overhaul U.S. policy toward China, and participated in key U.S. government interagency deliberations on major policy and government actions with regard to China and other East Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. I don't think I could give a better introduction than did Mike Pompeo himself in his recently released autobiography, Never Give an Inch. So I'm going to read this paragraph about Miles Yu, who is spoken about in a number of places in this book. Here's what uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says about Miles. Another powerful asset was a patriot named Miles Yu, born in China during the Mao years. He grew up firsthand seeing the brutality of party rule. As a young man, Miles was intrigued by the words of President Reagan and came to the United States to study. He fell in love with American ideals of liberty and got involved with the Chinese dissident community. He eventually became a U.S. citizen and a professor of Chinese studies and military history at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. In 2018, as a supporter of the Trump administration, he accepted a temporary assignment to work on China policy at the State Department. He was invaluable to me time and again by providing historical context on China policy, insights into the CCP's thought process, and bold policy recommendations. Miles also held the all-important China portfolio in the Office of Policy Planning. If Miles didn't sign off on a policy recommendation, it wouldn't move ahead for my approval, unquote. Well, Miles, that's a high recommendation indeed. Uh, you are also the author of uh, several books on China, but uh, let's move right into our topic. What the CCP's, the Communist Party's approach to the COVID outbreak tells us about the party. Well, the party is a Marxist-Leninist party. Like all such parties, they have the incredible sense of historical mission. Their mission is to liberate the rest of the world from a capitalist misery. So you might say the Chinese Communist Party is a, uh, is a party with a millenarial vision. When they say uh, China is uh, carrying out something called socialism with Chinese characteristics, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's Chinese nationalist characteristic. Characteristic. It always means uh, socialism with Chinese Communist Party characteristics because they always believe that the Chinese Communist Party is better than all other Communist parties which have failed, particularly the Soviet Marxist revisionism. They believe, uh, uh, you know, uh, since Khrushchev, the Soviet the way of communism is wrong, is revisionist, is socialist imperialism. And, uh, you know, uh, Cuba and uh, North Korea, they're communist, but they're a little bit more feudal, right? You know, when father dies, they pass the power to the son, the son pass power to the grandson. And when brother steps down and the power was given to, to the younger brother, right? Like in the case of Cuba. So China believe is most authentic communist party. As such, China believe that it can do a lot of things with the enormous control with control of enormous resources. So when COVID hit China, China decided it has the power and capability to basically eradicate every single COVID infection. 
against science, against uh, expert advice. Uh, just like in 1950s, Mao Zedong believed the Chinese Communist Party is so awesome, it could eradicate all the sparrows uh, in China, which ended up in disaster. So this is the theoretical and ideological origin of the COVID-0 national lockdown, which has caused the in immeasurable misery to the Chinese people. So once this policy did not work, so the Chinese Communist Party realized, you know, the, the infection is out of control. So it suddenly lifted the, the national uh, lockdown and which uh, basically, you know, uh, the infection just, just spread like a wildfire, if you will. Just last week, the Chinese uh, CDC's chief epidemiologist admitted that 80% of Chinese population have been infected with COVID. That's 80% of 1.4 billion people, which you translate the actual number is 1.1 billion. That's 1,100 million Chinese people infected with, with COVID without any adequate preparation at all for relief. That's why Chinese health system is totally, totally chaos uh, in, uh, in shambles right now. So uh, this is just like another humanitarian disaster, if not the downright crime. Miles, what's extraordinary is uh, the repeated assertions by President Xi that China's policy was following the science. And he said this so many times, it was echoed in the West and in other areas of the world that spoke almost with envy at the amount of control China could exercise to uh, control this outbreak uh, because of the, the apparatus of social control uh, that China had instituted basically to control its population. But there were some medical voices, some, some virologists and doctors at the time who said, there's no way this can work. This isn't the science, this is in defiance of the science. Tell us if people in China, at the beginning of the drastic lockdowns, them, did express themselves in this way, questioning the pseudoscience by which the CCP was pursuing this. The Chinese Communist Party never believed in science. As a matter of fact, the moment, the moment the outbreak occurred, the Chinese Communist Party got very excited. They look at this opportunity to showcase the extraordinary awesomeness of the party, the power, all incomes the power of the party. So the very first order Xi Jinping gave uh, to the nation was to unleash any kind of positive energy to showcase the Communist Party's pioneer role in this pandemic. Therefore, by, by positive energy, it means any negative news about this virus, its a, a mortality, human-to-human -human transmission, and all of those should be sort of you know, uh, uh, eliminated, silenced. So at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, you can see China launched national crackdown on the scientists, on the doctors, on the journalists who like to expose the truth. And the most famous one, of course, was Dr. Li Wenliang, who was a, um, an eye doctor in Wuhan. And he basically was the first guy to say, hey, listen, there was a new thing. It's very dangerous, uh, watch out. And for that, he was basically detained by the police and the lecture on and forced to sign a confession. You can see a lot of doctors in China, they're not allowed to publish any scientific journal uh, by national order. So this, this is nothing short of the man-made uh, disaster. Uh, science is not on, the, on their mind. What's on their mind is the Communist Party's longevity and the glory. I know that Secretary Pompeo said a number of times that the possibility that the virus may have been released from the viro virology lab in Wuhan had to be looked at. And nothing was more virulently opposed by the CCP and, and by President Xi, then exactly that possibility. You must have been close to this issue at that time. What can you tell us about it? Secretary Pompeo, as he related in his uh, memoir, actually gave me a marching order to, uh, to investigate uh, this in the early months of uh, 2020. So I did this some preliminary investigation and I submitted a report to him. That report 
contain two parts. One is the open source one. Another one contains intelligence reports. I can only talk about the, uh, the open source one, which basically goes like this. The Chinese Communist Party, the first thing they did was to issue an order to destroy the initial samples of the first patients. This order was issued on January 1st and then uh, written, circulate uh, to all the labs, including Wuhan Institute of Virology on the 2nd of January, 2020. This is basically you know, what they're trying to do. Subsequently, in the Chinese internet, uh, by this time, the Chinese government was still denying anything. They were kept silent. There was nothing there except Xi Jinping going, going around in circles, talking about the glory and the, uh, uh, the power of the Communist Party and the advanced nature of socialism and uh, Marxism. So, but the Chinese uh, uh, cyberspace exploded with all kinds of rumors, accusations, and what's going on in the Wuhan lab. The funny thing is, uh, when Chinese government finally came out to admit there is such a case, uh, 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 and that it's indeed, it could be uh, hum transmitted through human, uh, human uh, through human, there was mention of a lot of hospitals and medical research facilities in Wuhan where the outbreak took place, except the one place that is that should be at the center of all this uh, 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 turmoil, uh, that is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but nothing was mentioned of that. So that caught my attention initially, so I began to search for that, and, and basically it was a treasure trove boy. I mean, that Institute of Virology has done a lot, a lot of work uh, in this uh, 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 collecting and analyze and the genome function research of this virus. Of course, uh, the, the, so the world basically uh, uh, pay attention to a lot of them. There is no smoking gun at the time because the Chinese government does not really cooperate at all. And they colluded with the WHO by spreading disinformation, say this is uh, uh, nothing to worry about condemn the, the Western countries' uh, travel restrictions as a discriminatory. Uh, we dig deeper, and I think we discover a lot of circumstantial evidence, uh, not only uh, by uh, Western sources, but also by a lot of Chinese sources as well. Citizens began to disclose a lot of shocking details about the uh, lab, uh, lab's uh, uh, habit of, uh, for example, selling by lab animals to the uh, uh, local markets, either as pets or as meat. So uh, of course, those accusations cannot be verified because the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, would not make any comments, would not come out to, to, to clarify, to clear yourself. So this basically, uh, the absolute silence of that lab, which is China's premier, uh, highest uh, uh, biosafety lab, uh, it's very suspicious. And of course, later on, we discover a lot more evidence about the unique role that the uh, lab play, particularly with Chinese military's biological weapons program. Now, I, I don't believe that Secretary, former Secretary of State Mike, Mike Pompeo at that time or even now would assert that uh, China deliberately spread the virus overseas. However, it must have known, that is the CCP must have known late in the year, before this became uh, public with the World Health Organization, before the United States could take any steps against it, uh, that this was a very dangerous virus. And yet they allowed international travel to take place from Wuhan. And those travelers from Wuhan brought the virus uh, to Europe and the United States, according to some accounts. And even later, uh, when travel restrictions were placed, as you just pointed out, Chinese authorities protested vehemently. But they they must have known by that time the enormous dangers that they had let loose on the world. Is that an exaggeration, Miles, or do you think that's a, uh, a re reasonable suspicion? It's not an exaggeration, but I will take it from a different perspective. I don't have evidence to show that Chinese deliberately uh, unleash this uh, virus as a bioweapon against the entire world. I do know the Chinese biological weapon experts 
uh, admitted they were working on some very dangerous weapons. Uh, uh, one of which is called something called population specific genetic marking biological weapons. That means they designed the biological weapons targeting specific ethnic pop demographic groups. Okay, so this is the bioweapons, right? Uh, Chinese the military admitted this, they're doing this. But I do know one thing of uh, when I say I will like take this from the uh, different perspective. Secretary Pompeo and I uh, published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in, uh, uh, believe, last year, in which we stressed the issue of biosafety, whether this virus came from the lab or from the wild. That is the matter of scientific inquiry. Unless China fully cooperated, we would not know the answer. But I do know China's biosafety has been a consistent concern. This is a concern not only by international organizations, it's particularly concerning to the Chinese scientists themselves. The leading expert, leading authority on China's lax and substandard biosafety issue is none other than the director of Wuhan's P4 lab. Uh, let me just uh, put the, a few numbers uh, into perspective, so you can you can you can see why this is this is worry uh, this is a, a big worry for for the Chinese uh, uh, scientists as well. Two thousand three, China had the SARS outbreak. The SARS outbreak to the Chinese is total mystery. They couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. So the Chinese Communist Party given an order, say, hey, listen, let's just find out you know what went on and let's develop a vaccine on it. Let's do it in a sort of greatly forward campaign style, typical like a Chinese communist move, right? Uh, so all of a sudden, the Chinese biological uh, uh, virological research institute mushroomed in China. So in the following 12 years, the Chinese scientists, by their own admission, has gathered over close to 2,000 new viruses unknown to mankind. It took the entire world over 200 years to discover that many viruses. So in other words, you have this many newly discovered viruses that all concentrated in the country with such a substandard biosafety measure and standard. And it's very dangerous. The Chinese government knew this. Chinese scientists knew this. They published article, article, even books about this terrible issue. Right, so the act, the, if the, the outbreak in Wuhan is an accident waiting to happen, it should never have happened in a normal country with a normal transparency standard and normal biosafety standard. So, from that point of view, I can establish intentionality from the different perspective. That is, Chinese government knew this could happen, but didn't take any action against it. For close to three years, the Communist Party of China enforce their draconian lockdown program to supposedly restrain uh, COVID infections. And then after President Xi was uh, quote unquote elected to a third term as president, he switches dramatically, lifts the lockdowns, all, uh, removes all restraints to international travel. And of course, you just mentioned the tremendous statistic of the number of of Chinese people who have been infected by COVID-19. And the newspapers have been full of photographs of a very distressing nature of the emergency rooms in Chinese hospitals, the inadequate wards in which the victims of this virus are being treated. It looks like a, an, a, a real nightmare. And one can only speculate on the number of deaths that have been caused by this. Then we know a spontaneous reaction set in from the Chinese people. And there were extraordinary demonstrations around the country of people holding white sheets of paper. Somehow or another, the message got through the Politburo or, or to President Xi that this must have presented a danger and that he better end the lockdowns. Do you think that's how it happened? Uh, probably, but uh, I will add a little more uh, shades of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, 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 mindset. Uh, it is true that he uh, basically you know, uh, uh, steamrolled uh, himself into the uh, 
uh, longer term against the wishes of a lot of people uh, in, inside the party uh, inner sanctum. So when he steamrolled himself into that uh, uh, new position, he virtually had no, no ally in the China's upper echelon. Of course, the descent was always oblique. There was nothing really there uh, in the open, but he was pretty isolated, in other words. So there was an opportunity from, uh, from within. So he knew that his political enemies uh, must be looking for any kind of opportunity to do, to do him in. This COVID zero lockdown it has, nothing, has been nothing but a disaster, a catastrophe. So uh, this could be his undoing. But most importantly, you mentioned about nationwide protests. Do not underestimate the power of that. China is a totalitarian regime. They will not tolerate any sign of protest. This protest is not just uh, peasants from the periphery. This, pe- this uh, uh, protest is actually led by the elite, right? By the intel- in- intelligentsia, by the doctors. And, and uh, so this is the middle class. This is China's upper middle class uh, because a zero COVID lockdown means that everybody is stay in. And in, so you're talking about lockdown millions of the property owners, um, this is well off people. You cannot travel, you cannot even get out of the neighborhood, right? In some unique case, you know, if you try, they're gonna weld it in, right? So it's very, very draconian. So this gets a lot of people really, really mad. And not only that, the way the Communist Party handled this thing is through sheer lies. The mendacity is just beyond belief. So China people couldn't take it anymore. So he knew that the country is gonna be out of control. So uh, we have the telltale sign of the French Revolution <laughs> once again. So you have uh, uh, that. And another thing is uh, that most importantly, he had to change course because the Chinese economy was in shambles. And it, his uh, uh, sort of absolutely asinine COVID zero lockdowns has forced, we're talking about millions of, of business closed down. The unemployment was a sky high and the youth unemployment by Chinese Statistics Bureau's own admission is reaching 20%. That number is it has uh, is run, uh, running the risk of underestimate. Basically, you know, the uh, Chinese economy is in big trouble. So if you have uh, uh, so many people unemployed and it created a political problem, that is social instability. And Xi Jinping would be the only person to blame. So I think he had no choice but to change this. I mean, from outside, maybe he's Machia- Machiavellian power play, Machiavellian power play, but I think, you know, he really had no other choice but to change his policy. Yeah, let's talk about the costs of his COVID policy on the Chinese economy. He seemed, uh, because of his crackdown on some large corp- Chinese corporations, particularly uh, those focused on uh, uh, internet and communications, that the greatest interest uh, of the party was not a growing economy, but the control of the people. And uh, the uh, disciplinary measures he took against some of the leading corporate figures was a lesson that the party will exert control, that members of the Communist Party were placed on the boards of corporations to both carry out the party directives and report on any deviations from those corporations. That must have an effect on the Chinese economy. And of course, we know the growth figures, who knows how accurate they are because it's the Chinese government that issues them, nonetheless are the lowest uh, reported in, in almost the last two decades. So what are your comments about those two things, the cost of COVID on the economy and the cost on the economy of the control measures that the party has instituted on the economy. First of all, uh, the Chinese economic numbers were a joke. They announced that uh, the other day, uh, they uh, I think the last, uh, I forget which day, they issued, they announced two sets of documents, uh, statistics. One is on China's uh, population, demography. Another one is on China's economy. On um, population, from Chinese uh, authority, it says that, oh, for the first time we have a you know, negative birth rate. But also in the meantime, in the last year, uh, facing national lockdown and no international traveling, uh, that uh, uh, statistic still says there are 
240,000 immigration into China, which is totally unbelievable. It's, it's incredible. I, mean, I don't know how they, they do that. So uh, on, on the economic figures, uh, they said, uh, oh, China's economy is slower, only grow 3%. Even though China says it's only 3%, but it's better than the U.S., right? Better than, uh, than other countries. But it's still fake. I mean, exact, it's unimaginable that China, with that kind of uh, economic condition that I just mentioned earlier, could even grow into the positive zone. So let's go back to, to your, uh, the first part of your question. The COVID national lock, zero COVID national lockdown, lockdown is implemented by different provinces in China. There are about 31 provinces and equivalent in China. Each one of them was responsible to hiring a lot of the uh, 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 cops and, uh, and also uh, extra uh, enforcement forces. And also uh, they are responsible for uh, forcing people to take a vaccine. That costs a lot of money. So last year, every single provincial government, 31 of them, run a huge deficit. They run out of money. So the Chinese government also run out of money. So what they do, well, this is where she uh, uh, heightened his, uh, his, uh, uh, his pitch for something he called common prosperity, right? Gong tong fu yi. That means you know, to rob Peter to pay Paul. So that's why he went after private entrepreneurs, the billionaires, so to speak, like the CEO, uh, of uh, Alibaba, right? Like the CEO of Tencent. So all the super rich non-state, well, there's actually there's no such thing called the purely private uh, enterprise. Everything is controlled by the Communist Party. That, let's just say non-state uh, enterprises, right? So that's why he went after this and he threatened them with a, with a lot of uh, uh, arbitrary orders. So they forced him to donate an enormous amount of money to the to the state. So. So that's where basically you know, the, the, uh, the, the economy is right now. On top of that, on top of that, because China's lack of transparency and draconian lockdown, the Christmas orders sent to the Chinese factories dropped by 40% this year. So you can see the impact of the zero COVID lockdown. While the, every major country in the world is recovering uh, going back to the uh, to the ball games and lifting travel uh, restrictions, and China is, was the only country that still uh, wrapped up into the paranoia and the draconian zero COVID lockdown, and that's really really is important. So what they do is they will re resort to um, absolute lies and censorship. For example, during the height of the uh, of the national lockdowns, and there was a World Cup in Dakar, so Chinese television will show. Thousands of people in the audience without a mask. They were cheering, having fun. And yet Chinese official propaganda has been portraying the outside world as absolute hell. Everybody is suffering, everybody is dying. And so that wouldn't watch. So Chinese uh, uh, did some kind of very creative censorship on that kind of a message. So it's, it's a very, very tricky. So uh, the impact on the economy is, is tremendous, but the impact on the credibility and the trust of, of the Chinese Communist Party uh, is even more devastating. That last remark invites a question because a senior party representative went to Davos at that uh, meeting and uh, tried to convey a very positive message saying, China is open for business once again. Welcome Western entrepreneurs, return to China. Will, will that message, do you think, be trusted by Western businessmen and entrepreneurs? Or have they learned a lesson that investments in China can be a risky, risky proposition? And number one, and the number two lesson was that the, the chain of supplies was broken in so many ways due to China's policies, and also, for instance, domestic U.S. policies. In, in some misconceived COVID programs by the CDC and others. So best to move some critical manufacturing, such as for medicines, 
back to the United States or at least into allied countries so that we will have a reliable supply chain. Is that, see, I'm just so, is that damage permanent? Yeah, well, okay. So uh, the, the bad thing about the COVID crisis with regard to China is not just the vicissitude and precariousness of the government policies. It's also about the vicissitude itself. It's unpredictable. It, uh, the party can say one thing one day, that can say totally different than the other day. So because of that kind of lack of credibility, international capital doesn't like it. So that's why you can see the voluntary decoupling many Western corporations have taken. Apple, for example, right? So has all moved a part of its manufacturing capabilities outside of China to go to other countries that with more transparency and predictability. I doubt that China can reverse that kind of a trend because uh, one of the bitter lessons that the, the United States and many Western countries have learned during the COVID crisis, crisis is that China is not really into solving the international crisis by its generosity. China wants to, to exercise its leverage control so the, uh, to enhance its dependency. So that's why during the crisis, during and after the crisis, I believe many countries are creating their own uh, economic and health facility independence. So lessen their dependency on China. You can see that clearly, uh, clearly uh, in the case of the U.S. I mean, when we were in the uh, in 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 the government, and uh, it was painful to see that China control all the PPEs. They hoarded it before the outbreak. So when this outbreak did take place, and we found, found that we have to beg China for a decent supply, like a mask, right? So, uh, so that basically is the, is, is the major lesson. I think since then, we all know that uh, you cannot really re uh, trust the Chinese Communist government, and you have to develop your own uh, independence of supply chain. What will the impact of that be on Chinese economic growth, which it so badly needs? Because as, as you know, even though this is now the second largest economy in the world, the standard of living in China, uh, particularly in rural areas, is still very, very low. Many people describe a supposed bargain within China between the Chinese people and the Communist Party. They say there really aren't any communists left in China, but the party wishes to perpetuate its control. And so long as the economy is growing and people's standard of living is increasing, they'll say, OK, you go ahead and control the, the state and other aspects of our lives so long as our lives are improving. But if they don't improve, you, the Communist Party, are going to have a, a problem perpetuating your control. Is there some kind of implicit bargain of that kind between the Chinese people and the party? I think it, there's a lot of fallacies in that statement. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese uh, uh, economy obviously has grown tremendously in the last several decades, but it's primarily due to Chinese people's own diligence, hardworking, and, uh, and also due to the fact that China uh, enjoys unprecedented access to Western international free trade system. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, so China become enriched, but who benefit from, from the wealth? Not necessarily the Chinese people, but the Chinese state. The Chinese state is becoming enormously wealthy, but the Chinese people's living standard obviously is increased, but not nearly as the way uh, uh, they reach the, the, the bargaining uh, status right now. Now, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, two years ago, say something very, very interesting. When Xi Jinping say, oh, Chinese Communist Party is so great, so glorious, we have lived 800 million people uh, in China out of poverty. Li Keqiang said, well, not really. I mean, over 601 million, 601 million Chinese are still living under 1,000 yuan a month. That's under $5 a day. That's abject poverty. This claim was also immediately backed by the Chinese State Statistics Bureau. Statistics Bureau. So you, you, you do the math, right? You have like a, uh, nearly 40% of the Chinese population live under $5 a day. 
while the elite, the Chinese Communist Party elites, live in luxury, fancy cars, uh, skyscrapers. I mean, that's the sheer, sheer uh, disparity of the economic reality in China. So I don't buy the, the fact that the Chinese Communist Party's stability, longevity, stem solely from this kind of a tacit uh, hunky-dory agreement. The Chinese Communist Party's stay in power lies as a sheer repressive measure. The Chinese Communist Party fears its people the most. Chinese Communist Party spend more money on its what they call the dictatorship of the proletariat, in other words, all the control mechanisms, all the repressive tools, than on its national defense each year. That's pretty telling. China is building this world-class, modern Orwellian, even beyond Orwellian surveillance system. Every single move, every single speech the Chinese citizen utter and uh, make is subject to, to, to monitor surveillance. So in other words, every citizen in China is made known that whatever you do, whatever you say, sometimes whatever you think may be subject to, to state persecution. So that is something that I can see the willing cooperation between Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, there's nothing frightens the Chinese Communist Party more than the Western leader telling them the reality that Chinese Communist Party does not represent the Chinese people. When Secretary Pompeo made that, speech, made that statement, he drove the Chinese Communist Party uh, to the wall. I mean, they, they, were, they were violently reacted to that. So uh, we knew that they hit the nerve. Miles, in mentioning Secretary Pompeo, I had a thought early in the uh, Biden administration when uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken went to meet senior Communist Party officials in Alaska. They dressed the Secretary of State down and he gave a very meek response. I immediately thought, I don't think they would have dared try that when Mike Pompeo was Secretary of State because he would have wiped the floor with them. Do you think I'm right? You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, uh, this is in the context of, uh, of a Chinese uh, having this intense expectation that the new administration will change Trump administration's China policy. So they want the new administration denounce us, have 180 degree reversal. So which it didn't happen, even though there's an enormous party disagreement, this country is also very divided on virtually everything else. But on China policy, the party pretty much like agree on the fundamental points. So I think China realized that they got, they went berserk. So they went to Alaska to meet Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. They also, uh, along with the uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and so they did not avoid uh, the issue of specific policies. Instead, the lect they lecture American counterparts on the virtue of democracy, on the uh, on the superiority of the of the social system over capitalist democracy. It's actually the pretty clever tactic because they mostly use the rhetoric of the American left to make these points. And they, they attack American democracy as basically based on racism. They attack the American democracy as uh, being uh, manipulated by big money. So uh, they don't really care about this context of American politics. That is, uh, it's a democracy, you have different points of view, different interest groups uh, interact with each other. So take one side to denounce the entire system in which those debates take place. Secretary Blinken and uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan perhaps belong to the, the part of the debate that uh, the Chinese government was targeted on. So that's why they tried to muffle them. That reminds me of a meeting of uh, I was part of a small delegation meeting with Alexander Yakovlev, who was number two to Gorbachev uh, in the Politburo. This meeting with him was in Moscow. We made some critical remarks about the Soviet Union, and he lashed back by saying, oh, yeah, look at how you treat your Blacks. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's... And, yeah, so I took the opportunity to to respond to that. but. As you pointed out, this is a typical tactic of, of communist regimes because to Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, they, they had the, 
temerity to mention Black Lives Matter as a problem indicative of uh, you know racial injustice in the United States. Because they were giving straight Marxist-Leninist uh, critique, let's get back to th that significance in China today. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, so many uh, will say, well, there aren't, there aren't any communists left. But President Xi Jinping has been particularly adamant in enforcing party doctrine and ensuring that Communist Party officials are fully up to speed and, and Marxist-Leninist doctrine. Do they believe this? Is this sure. just an attempt to maintain their control and they need some doctrine through which to do it? So it's uh, a cynical ploy on the party leadership's part? Or is okay. there a serious re residual belief in this? Communism as, as a state e ideology, as a popular <laughs> belief, has died. Very few people in China on a popular level believe in communist ideology. It's basically the bankrupt ideology. The Chinese Communist Party cannot even export communist ideology overseas, overtly, because nobody wants to buy expired goods. However, the Chinese Communist Party, in their core, are without doubt a true believer of Marxism-Leninism. They are the true believers. They carry the mission of liberating others uh, from the misery of international capitalism. When I say Chinese Communist Party does not represent the, the, the Chinese people, this is a very important part of that. Most of the people in China do not believe in communism except the party elites, right? The very people at the top. What, so, what, do, what do they believe in? But what, what the Chinese people believe? believe? Yes. But they believe in the, basically in the, all this uh, uh, bourgeois uh, lifestyle, the pursuit of uh, a status symbol, just like a you and me, right? Like a lot of Americans uh, too. Basically, you know, they were able to basically maintain a, uh, uh, the engagement with China uh, by the West uh, provided Chinese people a window of opportunity to in engage with the other, uh, other lifestyle. So uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party tried, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, ability to restore the rigid and stridency of Marxist-Leninism education indoctrination uh, is quite remarkable because this is at the, every level. He even ordered the Communist Party cell to be at the, every level of the major corporations, uh, state-owned or uh, uh, private. So party must exert total control. So you mentioned about Liu He, Prime, Vice Premier Liu He went to Davos. He talked about, hey, let's open it up. You know, uh, China is welcoming you again. The irony is that uh, uh, this is the first year in the history of Davos where no Chinese billionaires, entrepreneurs were allowed to go, except the government official. Jack Ma was there all the time, but he's now in exile. So it's a, it's a, it's a very ironic. So uh, that's that's the difference between the Chinese Communist Party and the and the Chinese people. So uh, I will say um, the COVID actually is quite educational because people just realize the absurdity of the communist ideology. Anybody who believes that communist ideology doesn't matter at all in China is not qualified to talk about China uh, because they're ignoring the biggest reality in China. Uh, the party is driven by a few very simple Marxist Leninist tenets and uh, they carry it through with dogged rigidity and devotion. Uh, there should be no question about that. One aspect, Miles, of life in China that confirms your statement about the seriousness with which the senior party officials take Marxist-Leninist doctrine is their crackdown on religion, mm -hmm. of which uh, many people are unaware. And there are a few cases highlighted, but there are so many reports I have read of uh, churches in which uh, the crosses have been knocked out the off the buildings, in which uh, the crucifix is removed and pictures of Xi Jinping are put in, that the churches are se severely constrained, increasingly so, within usual communist doctrine, that's simply because religion is feared as a competitor and providing a deeper meaning to life 
because of the transcendent message that man's destiny is oriented to heaven and in Christianity through Christ. There are also rumors that Christianity is spread like wildfire in China uh, through under and that underground churches still exist through which this kind of a proselytization takes place. So can you talk about the effort to to repress and control religion and what might be happening despite it? There are uh, many uh, ideological consistencies of China's Communist Party. In other words, it carries through as essence of the party model of governance. It won't change uh, uh, regardless of who's in charge. Persecution against religion, all religions is one of them. So China's Communist Party's repression of religion, uh, as you mentioned, rightly so, is uh, is has everything to do with with the uh, the communist party's communist ideology, because it's not only as as a as a threat uh, organizationally, it's also ideologically is the threat. Let's talk about the organizationally. Organizationally, religious group recognize one leader outside of the communist party. That's not allowed in China. For example, if you're a Catholic in China, your ultimate authority is the Pope who is not under Chinese Communist Party control. That's the reason why Chinese Catholics have been systematically persecuted because their loyalty is to somebody other than the party itself. So this is the why, and, and of course, this, just look at this, this other issue, the Uyghurs. We know the Chinese Communist Party has locked up Uyghurs in the concentration camp by the millions. Not necessary to physically eliminate them, but mostly to brainwash them, to get rid of their, their Muslim uh, uh, religion, Islam religion, to wipe off their cultural identity, to, to make them into a socialist new man or new people, and to be indoctrinated with Marxism, Leninism, and the character thoughts of Chinese leaders, Mao, Deng, Xi, for example. So this is basically an ideological war. China has been conducting this ideological cold war against uh, religion for decades, never stopped. So that's, I mean, of course, the, uh, the part of the religious practice is that it does provide brotherhood for those who are oppressed. So um, the result is that you have a lot of underground churches. China spent a lot of energy banning, persecuting the underground churches, churches not recognized by the state. The state has a phony, sort of phony puppet churches, of course. Uh, one of the major issues um, uh, in the Catholicism, for example, in China is, uh, as you say, spread like a wildfire. A lot of, a lot of, something like 10 to 12 million underground uh, church members. That's a lot of people. But China does not want the Pope in Rome to appoint bishops. So this is the sort of the biggest issue between China and the Vatican. Uh, China wants to have a say in that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the current pope seems to give in to the Chinese bullying, and that's very unfortunate. Yes. Let's, toward the end of our conversation here, touch upon how all of this uh, influences uh, Chinese foreign policy today. Supposedly, they're toning down their wolf warrior conduct, which was on exhibit in the Alaska meeting, which you described. But do you think that the profile that they give the Taiwan issue is to inspire allegiance from the Chinese people uh, to the party as the defender of Chinese sovereignty? In other words, was President Xi's claim of sovereignty over practically the entire South China Sea during President Obama's administration, which did absolutely nothing about that audacious claim, or the way it reacts militarily to any sign of support for China through incursions by Chinese fighter planes and uh, ships into Taiwan's space. Does that resonate in mainland is that is that does that strengthen support for g i mean that's a 50 50 question right i mean in a country where information is totally censored and controlled uh 
uh, it's possible that you can uh, can sort of uh, sort of wild up the nation um, for your political purpose. Uh, but I doubt uh, uh, that will be 100% sure it's going to happen because people in China were so upset with the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, anything on like Taiwan is going to be a uh, very, um, uh, very uh, unpredictable, I shall say. Now, you mentioned about the Chinese claim of Taiwan as a sovereignty issue. That's also bogus. Uh, modern China was born out of the uh, thousand year legacy of the tributary system. In, our, in other words, China is considered consider itself as the middle kingdom, as the sort of, you know, the paradise uh, around which all the other states in the periphery are supposed to kowtow to pay tribute to China in exchange for China's protection. In other words, when modern nation states emerged along China's periphery, China has a border dispute with virtually every one of them. So that's just history. So the Chinese Communist Party inherited that kind of mess. So this gave Chinese Communist Party opportunity to deal with this. And so the way the CCP regime has been doing this is completely opportunistic. In other words, to those countries around China's periphery that China consider friendly, socialist in particular, communist, China has no problem negotiating away territories several dozen times bigger than Taiwan. For instance? Soviet Union, Mongolia, mm -hmm. um, and, and in the 50s, uh, uh, and, and uh, there's one country that's in south, south uh, west part of China is Burma. Burma has been socialist, they're very pro-China. Pro so they negotiate away with that. So this has nothing to do with sovereignty. Sovereignty is just excuse. The reason Taiwan become a stick, uh, sticking point in China's crusade is not tai Taiwan. It's the United States, because the United States has always backed Taiwan. Since the 19, late 1990s, the urgency to take over Taiwan has become more urgent because Taiwan is going through this profound and a very exciting, exhilarating transformation from dictatorship to democracy. Taiwan is a beacon of freedom and democracy in today's world. Uh, it's a really amazing place. The transformation of Taiwan into a democracy has enormous inspirational power uh, uh, over Chinese people. Many people identify with Taiwanese culture, Taiwanese uh, democracy, and that's what the Chinese government, Communist Party fear most. That's why they keep trying to drag this Taiwan issue into a sovereignty issue, as if with Taiwan, how the government formed, how the nationhood was formed, and how the political system uh, is different from mainland China, doesn't matter at all. So. That's basically, you know, uh, it's pretty desperate in that, in that regard. So I don't think essentially, uh, essentially this is going to happen. Uh, of course, it's also uh, uh, incumbent upon the Taiwanese government to educate its own population of 23 million freedom-loving people that they should be proud of what I've achieved. In, for the first time in human history, a Chinese community could form a true democracy. They should be proud of it. And I think, you know, uh, uh, in the West uh, um, and in democracies along, uh, around the Indo-Pacific. Taiwan has more allies. And I think, you know, uh, uh, people look at Taiwan as a, uh, a, a epic struggle between freedom and tyranny, uh, freedom and dictatorship. They more look at from that point of view, uh, particularly in light of what's going on in Ukraine. So uh, this is a particularly inspirational to, 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 to freedom-loving people in the world. So I would I would not think that Chinese Communist Party would uh, uh, actually uh, do such silly things. On, speaking of Ukraine, I mean the lesson should be very profound for the Chinese Communist Party. If they venture something militarily, the chances of winning is not hundred percent. If it reaches a stalemate, China couldn't last near as long as Russia uh, has in Ukraine. So um, because of the enormous domestic problem is the economic problem, and let alone. It's a, 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 a predicted uh, severe international sanction. Now, the sanction, the impact of sanction will be much, much severe than Russia uh, has endured. That's because unlike Russia, China has been so much uh, uh, integrated into a global free trade system. And if we pose uh, 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 that creative dependency uh, 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 of China on the rest of the world too. So uh, the Chinese government knows this. Well, I first of all would like to remark that I completely share your 
admiration uh, and enthusiasm for Taiwan. I was privileged to spend a summer there many years ago uh, through National Chengchi University and admired what I saw there greatly. Um, and, and I was deeply impressed by the preservation of traditional Chinese culture. So something that's maintained while at the same time it make the, the achievements of economic growth and uh, uh, democratic government. My experience on, on the mainland is very limited, but I was deeply disappointed in the lack of that traditional Chinese culture which I was hoping to see there, uh, but within, again, my very limited experience was absent. Now, I just would like to say that even though the repercussions for China, if they invade Taiwan, would be economically horrendous for the country, the strategic significance of Taiwan is great because of the sea routes it abuts, Whoever holds Taiwan is, is in a powerful position. Japan was obviously aware of its significance, which is why it occupied the island for 50 years or more. And I believe China is aware of its strategic significance to the point that quite remarkably, the government of Japan is undertaking a serious rearmament effort and speaking more explicitly of the dangers it faces from China and that its Southern Senkaku Islands are under threat from China as well. So if, if the Chinese Communist Party were to gain uh, control of Taiwan, the situation of Japan would be seriously compromised. Is, is that an accurate assessment, you think? One of the major shifts of uh, the Taiwan issue in the last five, six years is that international community increasingly look at the Taiwan, not as, uh, as a regional issue, not as just a, between China and Taiwan, but as the beginning of the chain of aggression by the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, China uh, wants to go uh, to start with Taiwan and then take on many other countries because China has grievances against the many countries. Uh, Japan, you mentioned, right, in particular, Vietnam and India and uh, the Philippines, um, even South Korea. So you have a lot of issues over there. So Taiwan is China's true data land. It will never stop at Taiwan, just like Hitler would not stop at the uh, Sudetenland land in 1938. So uh, this is a why to defend Taiwan has international significance. And this is why the defense of Taiwan is not just a, 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 a for ideological I and mean, value reasons, defending democracy freedom. It also strategically is a very necessary thing to do. So other actions that have been taken in light of that assessment, uh, which seems to be shared by many countries in yeah, I mean, I think, Southeast I, Asia, Southern Asia, sorry? You're absolutely right. I mean, Japan has uh, has come officially out of the shadow of World War II. Japan has been very shy in terms of uh, uh, playing a major role in its own security, defense in particular. Japan just, uh, you know, uh, a few weeks ago announced uh, that uh, Japan is going to spend up to 2% of its national GDP on defense by 2027. Japan is going to basically, you know, to change its defense posture completely from a defense oriented to also develop preemptive and counter-strike capabilities. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And Japan also, for the first time ever, named China as its primary challenge over North Korea and over Russia. So this is quite extraordinary. I mean, you look at the Vietnam. Vietnam is the country that has fought war with China for, uh, for several decades now. You might say that's this communist internecine fight. Yes, that's true, but a fight nevertheless. So India obviously uh, has a really huge uh, conflict with China. I mean, India and China has, has, has reached the brink of war several times in the last several years. So uh, uh, you can see the intensity of a dislike of China, a dislike in China. It's, it's a, just a, 
uh, it's around the periphery of China. So it's a it's a, it's a very very unfortunate. I hope you know, uh, for the sake of the world peace, we sh we should all realize the degree to which Chinese Communist Party is a threat, and uh, not the Chinese people. Uh, they should be our allies. We should work with them. Yes, and I I just think we ought to add Australia into the mix because it excess it certainly has expressed its concern about the China threat and is is taking some measures to uh, defend itself in alliance with the United States and other countries. But I have to say, when you look at the Chinese military buildup compared to the militaries of the adjoining countries and the, the, the timeline, for instance, that it will take Japan to undertake that military buildup, it's forecast pretty far into the future which puts China in the position of thinking, well, I'm in the catsbird seat now, but if I wait 10 years, I, I, I may be facing uh, greater problems from these states on my periphery. So it would be to my advantage to move now rather than later. Somewhat like the assessment that China made when the oil embargo was put on it by the United States and uh, Great Britain and the Netherlands. It had enough oil to last for a couple of years, but it would it would be weaker later. So hit now. Is that danger present in this situation? Do you think? I doubt that's going to be the case. Yes, it increases China's calculation uh, to risk uh, 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 more aggressively. On the other hand, China also understand um, even though in a democracy. It takes longer to get the budget approved. That's how it works. But don't don't under, underestimate the engineering, engineering and the innovativeness uh, uh, of the Western countries. Japan, for example, is a sleeping giant. It has an enormous potential for uh, for engineering excellence and the designing excellence. So Japan's weapons is first rate, right? So uh, um, so I think you know that's basically you know is going to be uh, is I think it would be foolish to think that way. Uh, United States uh, is, is never a, a country that built on permanent uh, uh, um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 force uh, per se, even though we are the number one force in the world. But we constantly try, uh, uh, in, a, in the absence of the war, uh, we constantly uh, try to sort of uh, downgrade the degree to which our military force is powerful. But now we are facing the China challenge. I think it, many countries are already mobilized. And we have reoriented our economy, and we have restructured our defense and intelligence communities. And I think, you know, uh, um, again, no, it would be foolish for China to think otherwise. On the other hand, our industrial base is nowhere where uh, no, nothing to compare to what it was back in, say, 1940-41 in terms of shipyards, our ability to, to build the ships we need, uh, and the other implements necessary for our defense. So that's, that's, that's going to take some time. However, you mentioned the analogy of uh, Ukraine several times. It was a surprise to a lot of people because of uh, President Vladimir Putin's much vaunted military reforms in Russia that these conventional forces performed so badly in the field against Ukraine that the military equipment, the trucks and tanks, were um, in a such a poor uh, state of maintenance that they broke down and that they couldn't continue on the route that they were supposed to take. And that the command and control structure, the communications, everything was very, very poor, leading to great losses on the part of Russia. China also undertook a military reform. It was rather well known for the state of corruption, particularly in the upper ranks of how much it would cost to buy uh, the position of an admiral or a senior general who could then collect funds through the corrupt military system to, to make up for those payments. But that under Xi, that has changed. Of course, he's much wanted for his anti-corruption campaigns, which I think any intelligent observer sees was used to enhance his political position and to get rid of his political enemies. However, 
as the Chinese military improved substantially under those efforts of reform undertaken by Xi and has corruption in the Chinese military been corrected to the extent that if it does go into action, we won't see the kind of failures uh, represented by the Russian military in Ukraine. Chinese military obviously has a, a make a very impressive uh, uh, progress in its fighting capabilities. So there's no doubt about that. But uh, in the meantime, China also has uh, enormous weaknesses and uh, vulnerabilities that we could explore in the time of war. China's strategic rear is so huge, it become not only become a, a, a base, but also become a target, right? So it's, it's hard to miss. China has some, uh, unlike the, the, the West, uh, which is more or less in a, uh, uh, involved in a very big alliance system. U.S. has a very big alliance system. China has no allies. Uh, the Russian uh, uh, Chinese alliance is just in name only. Russia uh, uh, doesn't want to play the game by Chinese playbook. And the biggest worry, of course, is that China also, once the war started, whether the population can go along with the party. That's a big if. So uh, if the Chinese population doesn't want to play along, and then the, the, the war is doomed. Now, you mentioned about uh, the, uh, the anti-corruption. Anti-corruption is just another way of political purge. It's pervasive. I mean, virtually the entire PLA leadership team under previous, uh, under Xi, Jinping's, uh, Xi Jinping's predecessor have been purged by him. We're talking about close to 100 senior generals and admirals were purged. Now, that's just not individual because Chinese system is a very sort of, a, has a very elaborate patronage system. Each one of them also has its has a, is patrons uh, down the a command, a chain of command. So by the thousands, you might say, they're all purged. So uh, Xi Jinping is a very ideologically intoxicated. He tend to promote the senior military officers, not necessarily for their military merits, but mostly for their ideological loyalty and purity and the degree to which they're loyal to, to him. So I don't know how powerful a fighting force China is. Uh, I cannot elaborate on many of the uh, sort of uh, uh, classified uh, information, but if you penetrate on some of the, the Chinese military uh, morale, I mean, the dislike and the hatred towards Xi is enormous. The dislike of Xi Jinping as a leader. Oh, really? In yeah. The so, 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 so those are the uh, 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 vulnerabilities that we could explore, and, and I think uh, we will. How could you do that? How could you take advantage of that? That's a topic for another day. All right. <laughs> well, I'm going to close. This will be the last question. There's been a lot uh, of discussion uh, in the media and amongst scholars on China's demography, because for the first time there's been recorded a decline in the Chinese population. And the, de the demographic trends are that China will, will quickly age. And uh, supposedly it will get old before it gets rich, meaning with a large number of old people, it won't have enough young people behind them to support uh, the care and other needs old people have. And that, how much of a worry do you think this is for the party? And how big a problem? It's a big problem. Uh, you talk about old people, it's not just the old people. China's Communist Party's worry is actually uh, uh, more about these, uh, the young people, young couple in their most productive uh, uh, age and uh, with the highest earning power. That's because this generation of, uh, of Chinese uh, young couple in the 30s and 40s, they're all born uh, uh, in the one child policy. That is, they're all from, they're all from one child family. The one child family has been, one child policy has been implemented for nearly 40 years. Uh, so uh, until a couple of years ago, uh, if you were born in, say, 1980, that's when the uh, uh, one-child policy started to implement a nation nationwide. Say, uh, by, uh, by 2005, you will be 25 years old. You get married. And then uh, a few years later, you have a, your own one child, you're only allowed to have one child. 
and then your parents retire. Uh, so because China's terrible bankrupt social security system, the elderly care is entirely the burden of the children. So say you have your own child, one child, as a young couple in your 30s, then you have to take care of four sets of parents, four parents, yours and your spouses. So that's an enormous burden. And old people have tend to have, uh, unfortunately, more illnesses, health problems, and the Chinese healthcare system is just total joke. It's very expensive and, uh, and unreasonably cruel. So uh, that's why the pressure on the most productive age group is enormous. Uh, and then um, plus you have to make sure the own child will get, get best education and send them to the most expensive school. And uh, you would also work hard to get an apartment. China's real estate is also totally speculated uh, to, very, to be very expensive. Um, and then uh, uh, you would also have to uh, keep up with the Joneses. The social pressure is very big. I mean, if you never, never has a car, you might have a car. You never have a nicer car, you must have a nicer car. I'm not saying this is, this is all uh, 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 the case, but there is a lot of pressure uh, for get ahead of everybody, for getting ahead of everybody. So in other words, the people who are most subdued, who are most uh, sort of unhappy, are those young couple who are in a, a full reproductive age. So they have no desire to have more children. That's why when Chinese Communist Party discover this, uh, this problem, uh, they lifted the one child policy reluctantly two years ago, but it's too late. Nobody would have the extra weather withdrawal to actually have more than one child. So, uh, uh, so this, it's basically you know, a, a double whammy on the Chinese Communist Party. Well, thank you very much, Miles. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <clears throat> and I would like to thank Dr. Miles Yu, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and the director of its China program for joining us today to discuss what the handling of the COVID crisis in China tells us about the CCP and the, of course, the many other topics that we were able to include in today's program. I thank you for joining us and invite you to go to the Westminster Institute webpage or to our YouTube channel to see the many other offerings we have of uh, videos and lectures on China, Japan, Taiwan, but also the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the Middle East. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley.